Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Wonder Women podcast, the main podcast for the business magazine for women.com. In our podcast, just like in our magazine, we're focused on promoting women's voices in business, technology, STEM, politics, sports, arts, and culture. My name is Monica Antohi. I'm the founder of the business magazine for women.com and the host for today's podcast. Our Wonder Women of today is Ms. Carrie Rupp. She's the general partner of True Wealth Ventures, a venture capital firm focused on funding women led startups. We'll be talking about the dismal numbers of women in venture capital, as well as just as dismal numbers of women-owned startups that get funded. And then we'll give you all of the amazing numbers that'll motivate you to go hire a woman right now and go have her lead, if not your company, at least one of its main divisions. The numbers are great for companies with women in leadership roles. So great, in fact, that it is shocking that we're not seeing these numbers out on every billboard across the entire country. But before I take you to the recording, I'd like to take a moment and um, dive into a little bit of administrative things. As you know, the podcast is now available on YouTube, SoundCloud, and iTunes, and that's obviously how you found us. If you like what you're seeing and hearing, obviously, we would love for you to become our Patreon supporter. For the price of a cup of coffee or more, you'll get cool perks like getting your name mentioned in our next podcast recording or a handwritten card from us, or you'll get the current issue of our magazine, The Business Magazine for Women, delivered directly to your inbox. We've been called Forbes for Women and just made the top 10 digital business magazines for women. Yay! <laughs> our next issue comes out July 23rd. So get your own copy of the magazine right now and check out what all the hype is all about. Some of the perks we're working on bringing you for our Patreon supporters are uh, Wonder Women t-shirts, reusable shopping bags, makeup bags, and other goodies. So head on over to Patreon and make your pledge so we can send you that most awesome beach towel. <laughs> your support would allow us to continue bringing you these interviews with the Wonder Women of every industry. You can find us at Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Wonder Women podcast. That's Patreon dot com slash Wonder, Wonder Women podcast. All right, so that's all the admin for today. Let's get you to today's conversation. In today's podcast, we're starting to look at the financial aspects of startups and venture capital, uh, as well as women's roles in, in finance and women's role in startups and women's roles in, in the actual um, VCs. So um, we're going to talk to, uh, we've actually invited uh, Ms. Gary Rupp to the podcast today. She's currently a founding member uh, and general partner at True Wealth Ventures, and that's a venture capital firm out of Austin, Texas, that, and their main focus is women-led startups. Hello, Carrie, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's start by introducing you to our, our audience. Who is Carrie Rupp? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a broad question. Um, I know, I know, but like, okay. you know, background. Um, I spend my time right now, um, as you said, focusing on investing in women-led companies. So I spend most of my time as a venture capitalist uh, at the seed stage, and so we can talk more, obviously, about what we're looking for and what that means. Um, I spend a little bit of my time also teaching a class for the National Science Foundation's i yeah. program. And the purpose of that class is actually to expose um, faculty members and PhD candidates, postdocs, people in the university commercialization system to the concept of customer discovery. So they've been working usually on a technology or an innovation that they think the market's ready for, but they haven't done it usually uh, of the market-facing part of actually talking to the different potential customer segments and identifying a go-to-market strategy and a business model to make sure that there's something there. Um, and it's a little bit um, you know, backwards from what's usually happening in the tech world where people see a problem and then they go create a solution. In this case, it's often science or um, other technology where they've created um, a new innovation and now they need to go see if there's a market for it. And so customer discovery is really important. Um, and I mention that for, for two reasons because, uh, one, I think it's a really important process for all startups regardless of how they got um, started, but also because we think that those could also potentially be interesting deals for our VC fund. So why they may seem like two different jobs, we do think that um, either some of those teams will eventually become companies that we'll want to invest in, and we do see a lot of women um, in faculty and engineering and science and um, the fields that are of interest to us, but also um, that gives us exposure to the up-and-coming research that's happening in the different categories that we look at, and so it's also great education for us as VCs to understand the landscape. 
So that's who I am today. Um, my most recent last job was also in the startup space where I was the CEO of uh, Dream It Ventures, which is right. a startup accelerator, but we also raised a venture capital fund to do follow-on investing in the companies. And so I've been in this ecosystem for a while, um, so helping launch early stage companies and getting them funded. Um, and before that, I spent the you know 20 years of my career really as an operator in early stage startups, or mostly in early stage startups. So I started out out of college um, actually programming. In, in a role where I was at um, Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture, and moved pretty cold, you know, shortly thereafter to a startup where I was actually helping do product management and basically went to a series of startups because of the nature of the startup world. They would occasionally get acquired. I would end right. up in a big company. Um, and so then eventually would generally jump ship to the early stage. But I've done marketing, biz dev, sales, ops product management, coding. So really been, and, and honestly, that's pretty normal in the startup world. You have to yes. wear a lot of hats. Um, but I've been in sort of a BP of each of those departments, and so I've had a lot of exposure in the operating world. Those were mostly software and Internet companies during that time, both B2B and B2C, and so had a lot of exposure when I went into the accelerator to bringing that to bear, and I had um, started my own company, too, around 2007 or so, uh, focused on girlfriend getaway travel called Holiday Go Lightly, yes. um, which was a really fun concept, helping women get away with a group of friends, whether that was for a you know book club weekend or a bachelorette party, et cetera, but it was terrible timing, which is an important factor for sure. Yes. That the recession hit in so 2008. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, not a good time for uh, niche luxury travel. Nope. So learned a lot of important lessons um, that I think really are applicable to the startups I work with today. Um, just having started something, getting it off the ground, and then having to figure out that it was bad timing uh, and what to do about that. <laughs> Got it. Um, so can we go back a little bit further than that? Um, sure. You ended up with a BA in biology from Duke. So is that one of the reasons why you stayed in STEM? So basically, let's just go back and further. What brought you to STEM? What brought you to biology? Why was biology important uh, back uh, then? And, you want to remember my college days. So I had at, declared at multiple points many different majors at Duke. I don't think I knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I guess I'm still figuring that out, but um, no, I actually was, for a while I was majoring in foreign languages and English and psychology, and it wasn't until I think second semester of my junior year that I decided to major in biology uh, because I had been convinced by my parents and my parents' friends that it didn't matter what you majored in as long as you got this degree and, and then you could kind of go out in the world, and I liked the biology part of it. I actually spent the summer between my sophomore and junior year at the marine lab um, at Duke, so actually getting to work in <laughs> marine physiology. Um, and it was, I really enjoyed science and, and, and what it was all about. Honestly, when it came time senior year to thinking about what I wanted to do, however, there weren't jobs in science that really no. were particularly appealing to me, um, just the nature of what I wanted to do. And so I actually took the GMAT my senior year um, at Duke. So I definitely knew I was going the business route, and the, the science for me was fun, and maybe I felt like a little bit of an indulgence that I got to do this thing that I liked, but it wasn't going to be what I did for work. Um, and frankly, it wasn't for 20 plus years. Now Sarah and I are investing in the health sector, and we did some of that at Dreamit as well. Um, and so it's coming it's together for it to come full circle, but it took 20 plus years for that to actually matter. So, so but I think it actually helps you in your position right now. Um, so you can, you know, bridge, bridge the gap between the science talk and the business talk. So yeah, much the same way that actually coding, I mean, it's not like I was an expert coder when I was in my first job out of college where they just threw me into three weeks of COBOL training and then like set me loose on the client and I'm <laughs> horrified to think what they charged for my time given that I was learning if then statements on the job. But I think um, spending, you know, that period of time coding gave me a lot more insight into the process of technical development. So then I did work with the dev team and with clients and understood, you know, what the infrastructure would look like and what the timeline would look like for product development um, that has some credibility with the team. So I think those things, those baseline skills are important, even though my job is mostly today about um, marketing strategy, you know, business development, go to market, um, and some finance. I think having the underlying understanding of the technology, whether it's tech or science, is important. Absolutely. And so you ended up getting an MBA from Harvard and, uh, you know, you're, you're basically using all those skills and all the skills that you've learned since you know, to, to run a VC uh, fund uh, for women. Um, besides the VC fund for women, can we talk a little bit about uh, capital markets um, uh, in the capital, sorry, the capital factory um, in, in Austin? Um, why is that important? Uh, and how do you, what is your role there? Like your mentor role, or what does that involve? Like what do you do as a mentor um, at a startup uh, fund, uh, a startup um, 
Accelerator. Yeah, an accelerator. Yeah. So, so Capital Factory is one of the main um, hubs of entrepreneurial activity in Austin. Um, there are actually many ecosystem players here. We have other co-working centers. We have other accelerators. So there's, you know, Galvanize and WeWork and TechStars and Tech Grants, etc. And and we're lucky in Austin because it's a very collaborative environment. So we're actually all working together to kind of raise the, um, you know, ocean for all the ships essentially. But I, that's actually really true. When I was running DreamIt and we decided to expand it in into the Austin market. Yes. Capital Factory was actually evolving at the time from just a three-month cohort-based kind of accelerator to a physical space where they were going to do events and, you know, have an accelerator, but also, you know, do a lot broader set of things in the ecosystem. And we actually ran our first cycle of Dream It within Capital Factory. And then Techstars, when they came to town from San Antonio and other markets, they also did the same. And so it, sh it really speaks to the fact that we're all here about, you know, kind of creating an ecosystem for startups and finding what support structures they need. Um, and so my role at Capital Factory as a mentor really just means that I'm meeting, um, you know, monthly and making myself available to meet with startups, um, generally, hopefully, those, you know, who fit our thesis so that they can be a source of deal flow for us, but often also just as a way to give, you know, sort of expertise and guidance to the startups that aren't a fit for us but see some value in my experience or connections. Um, and so in the early days of a startup, I mean, for those of you who are in that space, you know you have lots yep. of questions or you need lots of connections. Um, and it's just an ethos of the startup community that you, you know, sort of pay it forward. Um, and so not only do I give uh, office hours at Capital Factory um, every month, but I actually also am doing that at Galvanize. Um, I offer some open office hours just at a coffee shop uh, in town to those who aren't connected to any of those networks as a way to at least share a little bit of time, you know, to the extent that I can with um, startups that aren't a fit necessarily for our fund, but could, you know, gain some value from, you know, the perspective that I have after looking at so many companies. That's absolutely amazing um, because I think as a startup founder, um, the, the beginning is, is rough. Um, you know what you want to do, you know exactly how you want it to, do, to get it done, but without any sort of, not necessarily coaching, but yeah, mentorship, um, you might get on the wrong path. Um, so, you know, it really helps getting a little bit of guidance here and there, just kind of now you in might the right direction. Get, you might also get lots of conflicting guidance because um, you're going you know, to have these meetings with different people with different opinions. And so I think that's important to know how to navigate. Um, and it's one of the things that startup founders will face is that if they have lots of mentor meetings, they're going to get lots of different opinions. They're going to have to figure out how to, like, sort of hold their own and pick the right advice along the way. So it's not as easy as just getting the meetings. You've got to figure out which advice is relevant for you. Right. Um, talking a little bit about um, Dream It, uh, Dream Adventures, um, because I don't – that seems like pivotal um, in your career when you started to, to work a little bit with more women, a little bit more um, with um, uh, a diversity. It, it, it was described as a diversity fund. So mm -hmm. um, I would love to know a bit more about that because it, it seems to be guiding you. <laughs> yeah. So, so DreamIt was founded by three um, entrepreneurs in Philly who had all had serial exits and they were looking to figure out how to give back to the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Philly. Um, and they actually spent a bunch of time looking around to see what, what was useful and what would have been useful to them when they were starting their companies. Um, and it was around that time that Y Combinator and Techstars had, you know, entered the market, which I think were like 2005 or six and 2007 respectively. Um, and that concept of a, you know, sort of mentor-driven model um, that was also still for-profit so that if we're asking yeah. these startups to be for-profit, then, you know, we should be able to be self-sustaining ourselves um, was what they decided would be valuable. And so, they started Dream It in 2008, and after running it for two summers, I think realized that they were onto something, and it was maybe more than they thought it was going to be. Um, and so I had worked with one of the founders of Dream It in a prior role, and so, um, you know, had connections to the organization. So I came in to help them, you know, kind of grow it into a more comprehensive year-round program with more systems and more um, resources around it. Um, and so in the time that I joined in 2010 until the time that I left in, I think, 2015 or so, uh, we went from one city to Philadelphia to running cities, running programs in New York, Tel Aviv, Baltimore, mm -hmm. and Austin. But then, as you alluded to, we also did some specialty programs around specific focus areas. So our first one we did in conjunction with a nonprofit called Startle, focused on ed tech startups. So, okay. uh, 
and they were funded by five major foundations, um, Hewlett, MacArthur, Kellogg, and Lumina Foundation, with the Nothing. concept being that in order to bring change to education, you'd probably have you know, more effectiveness by having some for-profit startups that were willing to kind of break the mold of what was done traditionally, and so we helped run the accelerator program to get them launched. And that started us on the path of realizing that there were other kinds of niches, whether they were vertical or otherwise, that could um, you know, really bring some focus um, to what we were doing around startup development. So we then run a program with Comcast Ventures, focused on minority entrepreneurs. Um, in their particular strategy, they were looking to bring more ethnic diversity mm -hmm. to the startup world, and, and they had a venture fund that would then potentially look at those deals to do follow-on investing, because they had allocated, um, I think, $20 million of their corporate VC funds to investing specifically in minority entrepreneurs, but we were helping create That's sort of good. more of a platform of deals for them to look at, and so we ran... I don't remember exactly, maybe three or four cycles of Dream It in Philly and New York where we would proactively go source minority companies, give them access to some resources to help them with what was unfortunately going to be a more challenging fundraising landscape, um, and had five out of the 15 companies in each of those cohorts be focused in the minority world. Um, and then we um, did programs focused on health tech. We did those in conjunction with Penn Medicine and Independence Blue Cross in Philly, and then with Johns Hopkins and Northrop Grumman and some other Kaiser Permanente yeah. in Baltimore. Um, and then as we sort of got the hang of doing these specialty um, accelerators where we could bring in you know, specialty resources and also customers and channel partners, et cetera, we realized um, you know, it was around the same time all the accelerators were coming to terms with what their gender ratios looked like. Yeah. Um, and so not only are women, you know, sort of underrepresented in tech in a way that we all know, but they seemed uh -huh. at least at the time to be all the more so underrepresented in these accelerator programs. And some of it was just the nature and the structure and the timing and, and the peer groups, et cetera. Um, but we decided to take a proactive um, approach to solving that problem. And so we uh, created something called Dream at Athena, which was the first yes. uh, accelerator program from a top tier accelerator focused on women specifically we're able to get funding from the Pennsylvania Department of Economic Development and Commerce to actually help fund that program. And similar to our minority program, we had five out of the 15 companies in, in some of the cycles of Dream It in Philly and, um, yeah, I think just in Philly, we would, um, you know, bring in, proactively source and recruit women to the program, also provide them with programming, you know, that was going to basically help them in their path. Um, and, you know, get them funded. And so it was um, shortly after that time that I actually, that I met Sarah. So I had been focused already in helping give access to early stage uh, women-led companies and then met Sarah who was looking to do the same um, on a broader scale. And that's how True Ventures uh, VC came, came around. Well, True Wealth Ventures was founded originally by Sarah, yeah, by Sarah um, and I, you know, I think you, you've talked to her about her story, but she basically was coming out of the corporate world, having worked in VC previously and wanting, knowing that she was going to eventually come back to VC, but trying to find the right space for it. Um, she was working um, at, for this big Fortune 500 company and was asked to be their executive sponsor for the Global Women's Forum there, and that's when she really got her eyes open to, um, you know, the dearth of women in tech and in her company specifically, but the outperformance um, that would happen when there were more um, women in senior leadership at companies. And so uh, we were actually connected because as she was looking to get reconnected to the VC space at Austin, mm -hmm. she really thought about her career and who she knew in VC and realized she hadn't met any women in VC, both when she was in VC in the Bay Area and then getting connected to the community in Austin. That's um, what she was and, saying. Yeah, and so when she mentioned it to uh, people in Austin around the same time, multiple people told her that she had to meet me as the other one. There was one other VC <laughs> uh, active, <laughs> active at the time in uh, Austin and we think maybe possibly in Texas, at least in, you know, true venture capital as the general partners, you know, in making the investment decisions. So we met, um, you know, originally just to connect around the topic and then just, you know, sort of spiraled <laughs> into us realizing that there was an opportunity to work together. So um, how do you see that? Like, how do you see working um, just with women? Um, I'm sure you work with men and women and, and any other company that you've worked with. Um, is it different working with women than working with men? Well, so we're not planning to only be women. I mean, the whole thesis right. here is actually about gender diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and we think the magic is actually in the diversity, not in being all women all the time. In fact, yes. you know, when we look at companies, our bar for whether a company fits our threshold is there has to be at least one woman of significant decision making authority on the founding mm -hmm. or executive team to bring her perspective to bear. And that's really consistent with a lot of the data around not only company performance, but actually team performance in general is about right. diversity. Um, and we think it's, it's the diversity well. that's the magic, not just 
you know, women. Although <laughs> you look at some of the studies of corporate boards, and you know, the more women you add, the better they get. But um, it is not our intention to only be women. We are only two people right now, though. So there's, you know, <laughs> only so yeah. many people. So Sarah and I are the two GPs. Uh, we're just women. We do occasionally bring in MBA um, interns, and so right now both of those are women. But we've had a guy in the past, and we would absolutely look to hire guys in the future too because we really think that gender diversity is, is important. So even um, at your level, decision making level um, in the VC world. Is yeah, important. it's just, you know, it's the, the realities of the economics and just the realities of a small fund the size of ours, 20 million, you're not going to have more than two partners and we probably won't for several years. So it's not because we're just trying to be all women, it's just we're, we're going to be two people for a while because it's right. a small fund. So. Um, what are you investing in? What um, areas of the market you're looking for, for you know, to, to invest in? Yep. Uh, so we can talk to more women and tell them how to <laughs> you know what to be interested in. Well, I mean, it needs to be a, you know, an area that they're interested in. But our, but our thesis is twofold. So the first layer of our thesis is to choose companies that have at least one woman on the executive team. And that really is to take advantage of this data that shows that when there are more women in senior leadership, whether it's at large Fortune 500 companies or venture-backed companies, they outperform financially. Um, and yet they're underfunded in terms of traditional VC dollars today. And so depending on which study you look at, which day of the week, it's somewhere between 2 and 3 or maybe 7%, you know, depending on the, what denominator you use, um, of uh, venture-backed companies that have women CEOs or women leadership. So it's way low. Um, and they're missing out on an opportunity. So layer one just says, hey, if we just invest in women-led companies, um, you know, we'll actually do better financially. But we're being more strategic than that. And then also looking at where women bring their purchasing power to bear. Correct. And having the woman on the team leverage her insight into those customers in order to design products more effectively, go to market more efficiently in terms of how to sell to, service, the, you know, market to those customers. So we look at the fact that women make 85% of consumer purchase decisions and 80% of healthcare decisions, and we think there should be at least one woman on the executive team in markets where the customer is mainly women um, for that insight. And, you know, it sounds so obvious, but 83% of venture-backed companies today don't have a single woman on the executive team. So it's not as obvious as one would think that every team's going to have at least one woman if their customer's a woman. And we'll see startups that are addressing pretty intimate women's health issues, and they won't yet have a woman on their team. And it just seems um, uh, like an oversight, say that politely, um, mm, to not yeah. think that you need a woman on the team to really understand the problem and the, and the strategy to, to solve it. And so uh, our fund is very specifically an impact fund. So we're not just in the, the uh, markets of consumer and health, but we actually are looking at things that improve human and environmental health. So we call it sustainable consumer and consumer health. And um, it's really about those things that are you know, improving human and environmental health where the consumer is involved in the buying or adoption decision. Um, what are a couple of um, strategies you would suggest for um, a company that, like we were talking about, um, is focusing on delivering products for women, <laughs> but they don't have anybody on, you know, on, the, on the executive team that's a woman. So you know, how do we increase diversity in, in, in companies, in startups specifically? Yeah, so we're not recruiters and we're not experts in recruiting, so I don't want to say I that I, have any, I don't have an answer to this necessarily. We get, we get meetings a lot of times with startups who tell us, we really want to hire a woman if you could just help us find one, and that's not actually <laughs> what we do. Um, and we're, we have applaud the you know, interest, and a lot of times you know, it's very, it's the first step is literally the company understanding the value of it, not just because they understand the customer, but the value of having diverse viewpoints around the table. And by the way, this is an aside, um, maybe for now, but um, diversity of all kinds and types has actually been shown to be more effective for team performance, et cetera. So we're talking today about gender, about ethnic right. diversity, socioeconomic as well diversity. as ethnic diversity. All of these different kinds of points of view are, are valuable. And so I think just companies understanding that from the get-go and not just hiring all the, their friends who are like them, who they enjoy being around, which could be more fun, and you already know them and trust them. And so there's, it's not like... You know, there's a natural reason why teams start looking a lot like each other. Right. And it actually, while it might feel more comfortable at first, actually kind of leads to, I guess, com potentially complacency and just, you know, sort of a single-mindedness of thought as opposed to, you know, some maybe sometimes conflict or different points of view that actually at least opens the horizons. And so um, I think the first thing is start with being in an ecosystem where they get exposure to people that they don't already know that aren't like them. Um, and so if, you know, there's been this traditional recruiting or hiring mindset that you go through your network. 
Um, and it has a lot of value, right, because you can trust the referrals and you sort of know where they're coming from, you understand them. But if you only do that, you don't get to see the candidates that are unlike you and that have different points of view. Um, and so getting a little uncomfortable and maybe going to networking events that are completely outside of your scope and, and um, also trying to get introductions to people who you don't know as opposed to people you do, I think are important. You know, there's the Rooney rule that's been used in football. Um, it was originally used by the NFL to try to get more ethnic diversity in their coaches. Um, and what they did was institute a rule that you had to see screen at least one candidate of color, I think. It might have been multiple candidates. But they had to basically go out of their way to find the candidates and at least have the interview. There was no bar set around actually hiring that you know candidate or anything else. It was just going through the process of meeting some people that weren't like you and putting them through the same process. And just that step actually, you know, dramatically changed the number of uh, coaches of color in the NFL. And so there's a similar concept that's been, you know, sort of proposed to do around gender in hiring as well. And so making sure you're proactively, you know, identifying a slate of candidates and actually having those conversations with them, putting them through the process is step one. Um, and then obviously you can get, you know, much more proactive in terms of, you know, setting some standards around how you're going to have diversity on your team. And, and I think what also helps with, you know, the diversity also helps with the um, um, point of view of um, you're creating a product, yes, but you're not creating that product just for your group of friends. You're creating a product for everybody else. If your product is just for your friends, you're good to go. <laughs> Do that. But, you might not um, have a big enough market size unless you're exactly. super popular. <laughs> uh, but if, if you actually want to expand out of your group of friends, you, you know, your team needs to include people outside of your sphere of, uh, of influence and your, your, your uh, connection. So um, great point. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, how there's mostly men, 96% of the funds are basically led by men, um, it, it, you know, DC funds. Uh, you and your partner are pretty important in this, in, in this trying to bring back balance to the force when it comes to how many women are in DCs. Um, what do you think matters um, to you? Like, um, how, I mean, we know that's important because without you, uh, there won't be that many women in, uh, you know, uh, startups. Uh, because as a male uh, VC, you're most likely not going to invest in a female um, run startup. The, the, the chances are kind of low. How is that conversation important? How are we um, getting more women investors? Well, we hope, we hope it's going to change, honestly. Um, there's been some attention to it of late. Um, and so, we think ultimately the most effective lever will be showing that these women do continue to outperform and having women invest in women. We, you know, it doesn't Data matter. The, Data the plan should not be matters. forever that women have to invest in women and men invest in men, right? Yeah. I mean, Sarah and I would actually like our thesis of, you know, specifically going after these women-led companies to go away because yeah. it's no longer unique. It's a given that you want diversity on your senior leadership team. And it's actually not a high bar to expect at least one woman on your team. And so um, the end goal is that we don't need gender diverse um, funds that are just very focused specifically on that as a, as a criteria. Uh, we think it's important now to kickstart the issue because it's not happening natural with the data, naturally with the data being two to three percent of, you know, companies with women CEOs getting funded. Right. Um, you know, it's just, it's not happening naturally. So what we have found to be effective, and to be fair, this was not actually a proactive strategy from the start, but it, uh, we saw it as we were fundraising, is that women investing in women should and can be the starting place. 80% um, of the investors in our fund are women, and we did not go in at the outset oh. thinking that our fund would be, um, you know, mostly funded by women. In fact, we had been told uh, that women were risk averse and they didn't invest in funds and so they wouldn't really be the right LPs. And so we thought, okay, well, we'll invest money. Well, I mean, to be honest, if you're a venture capital fund, you just want to take whatever money is interested in investing in your fund and, get, and deploying your strategy. And it's less important where it comes from. It's not the same for a startup where they really need to have a bunch of added connections and all these other um, benefits of smart money. You know, we as it turns out, have those benefits too, but it's not always important for a VC fund to have that. They care about the capital and then being able to right. play the strategy. So when we did our first close on the first $5 million of the 20 that we raised, um, we looked at the profile of it and realized we had about 50% or maybe more um, women as investors. Now, whether that's individual women, bless you, 
I'm so sorry. No problem. Uh, individual women as investors or, you know, women from a couple where a woman made the investment decision or a woman from a foundation or a family office, that's how we, you know, counted that criteria and we realized, wow, we had a lot more women than we expected. Um, and then as we started moving forward, we realized those women were actually opening up their networks virally much to a much higher level than the men who had invested. And it became this, um, you know, steamroller effect uh, where all of a sudden, um, we started getting more and more women, and we realized that that was a real opportunity. And so then we got much more proactive about it, women. Um, and when we went back to ask all of our LPs what drove their investment decision, um, it was both the combination of the data showing these women outperforming and that they were, you know, underfunded and that was just a disconnect that they could take advantage of, but right. also really understanding sort of at a gut level and emotional level um, the capacity that women had and that it was, you know, something that they, where they really felt that that thesis resonated personally and emotionally and that they wanted to help you know, sort of address that issue while also taking advantage of it from a financial returns point. Financial, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, we, you know, ultimately had 80% of our investors being women, and we think that, you know, they're the ones who are going to move the needle here to actually let funds like ours exist where we can then invest in more women, have them show their performance, Mm -hmm. convince other funds that they ought to be looking at this. But also when women have uh, increased wealth, they reinvest 80% of it into their families and their communities, health, education, and welfare. So it becomes this, you know, really self-fulfilling prophecy of, you know, impact and good. Um, men do that too um, at 40%. And so it's just that women do it at twice the rate. And so it just really becomes a, you know, sort of great cycle of prosperity. And hopefully eventually, you know, gender diversity will be just a given uh, later on, yes, hopefully, uh, like you're saying. Um, so what's important right now at this stage is um, data, showing the data, showing um, all the numbers and what they actually are. So in, in order to educate more investors and to take in more um, uh, female founders, you know, female startups, you know, female, they, we need to show the data. We need to show all the data there's regarding. Some, yeah, there's some great data out there. So McKinsey started some of this work in 2010 mm -hmm. with their study, Women Matter, uh, focused more in their case on their database of companies, which is more Fortune 500 publicly traded right. companies. But showing that uh, in their top, in their database, the top quartile of teams that had the most women in senior leadership saw 40%, I think, were higher return on equity, 56% higher EBITDA, uh, which is a really powerful statistic. It's not a small incremental margin. It's yeah. a, you know, almost 50% plus, you know, improvement in these operating margins. And so that can really move the needle. And for companies that are, you know, trying to make incremental improvements, you know, bringing in that gender diversity can really be valuable. And then there's more data from a bunch of other uh, sources now looking at it across the startup world. You know, American Express has done it in the um, small business world. Um, and so there's a lot of great data out there. And I think it's starting, I think, over the last year, and it could be that I'm in a little bit of an echo chamber, um, you know, in my world, but it's starting to get out there. And so now, um, you know, helping people to internalize it and actually act, like change their behavior to act on it is the next step. And well, so from, we're proactive. From study to, from study to um, you know, everybody knowing about it, there's a massive disconnect. So, so what, I, what we're trying to do is basically <laughs> connect the dots for, so right. we can get into, like, get more people the data that is super important. Um, and, and it actually encourages women to be a little bit more active in the startup scene, as well as women to invest more. Um, so, yes, from, it encourages women on both sides fields uh, yeah. of starting up and investing. Well, so, and, and there's, there's been good movement on women investing more at the angel level. Mm -hmm. um, and so with a whole series of tools over the last couple of years, like Pipeline Angels and um, other tools that are, you know, educating women on how to be a, you know, effective angel investor. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to remember the exact number, but I know over the last 10 years it's actually increased significantly and it continues to do so. I think the fact that our fund is 80% funded by women is we were under the impression from everything we've heard that it's sort of an unheard of number and so that's new as well. So we're seeing those trends. Um, it's just, unfortunately the numbers of women in VC have dropped since 1999 when they were around 10% and then mm -hmm. Depending on which study you look right right now, it's somewhere between two to four percent. You know, and in terms of investment decision making partners, it might even be lower. Um, but there is a lot of attention to that this year, and there are certainly, if not all women funds, which I don't think are necessary. Um, right more women getting into venture and a bunch of efforts underway to bring attention to this uh, this um, issue and a bunch of the women who are senior 
in existing firms today have banded together to put a bunch of resources in place as of late um, to have databases of women who are looking for roles, you know, introducing firms to this candidate pool, you know, and providing some other tools and resources to get more women into these positions. So, and then there's a HBR study that showed that if there are women investment decision-making partners at firms, those firms are twice as likely to invest in a woman uh, founder and three times as likely to invest in a woman CEO. Um, so just getting them into traditional firms, even without a gender lens focus at the firm, will you know, presumably naturally increase the number of women who are getting funded. That's massively important. Um, so what you were kind of describing is a good old girls network starting to shape uh, up. Yep, yep. <laughs> and there are several of those happening, yes. That those are really good, uh, and I'm not saying we should exclude men, but I think we should have those networks. I think they're they're important for, um, you know, to get more confidence in the in this investing field and and in the space. Um, and uh, you know, a little bit more education needs to come out of these networks as well, so we can, um, you know, cause from a financial point of view, from a financial independence of women point of view, we need more women to invest at whatever level um, in, in in startups in in anything basically, so we can actually gain a little bit more um, financial independence as as women. Yeah, in we general. actually our our country needs it for innovation too, because women are actually coming into more wealth. So there was a book called right. The Power of the Purse, and it showed that basically through a number of different changing demographics um, in our country, women um, control about 40% of U.S. investable assets today, but it's predicted by 2030 that that'll go up to two-thirds of U.S. investable assets. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have women you know, who are all of a sudden coming into control of more and more of these assets, investing in our innovation economy through angel investing and fund investing, et cetera, um, the dollars that we have available, you know, to our innovation ecosystem will go down dramatically, and that's not great for our competitiveness um, and our innovation as a country. So it's not just an imperative for women, it's actually an imperative for the country and for innovation in general. And, and again, our next issue is focused mainly on finance and cannabis, but it's, it's the, the business of cannabis, not the smoking of cannabis, um, <laughs> although hopefully it's going to be legalized. Um, the, the financial part of it, uh, it's so important right now because uh, a retirement without investment, without you know, just, just working a normal job, a retirement, we end up with half the money that uh, a, a man um, mm. Does and which puts us in danger of, of bankruptcy and losing, you know, and, and basically being poor and destitute halfway through our retirement. So, any um, any suggestions you might have for women, um, any women right now um, that are starting up, that are you know in business, um, you know, getting their uh, business degree or or any sort of like starting up in the business world. Any suggestions you might have around investing? Around investing, yes. Yeah, so I, so I don't want to pretend to be an investment advisor or to be an expert in that. I will just say no. that there are some cool tools available now. Um, so there are a number or at least a couple of initiatives where um, you can identify uh, opportunities to invest specifically in women-led companies if you believe in that and it aligns with your values and you believe it's a financial you know, upside possibility. Mm -hmm. So there's an initiative at Wharton um, that's focused on actually sort of cataloging and identifying all of the um, women-led investment opportunities, the name of which I cannot recall right now. Um, but then there's Pax Elevate and another mm -hmm. um, investment uh, vehicle at the street, uh, uh, yeah, State Street Bank, both of which have, you know, tools where you can invest specifically in women-led opportunities. Um, and then there's also obviously access to lots of new kinds of investing, right? So whether you're going to do some crowdfunding or, mm -hmm. you, you know, equity crowdfunding um, or other kinds of things, I just would advise that everyone should be under, understand the sort of risk of investing in the early stage ecosystem and make sure you're at a place financially where you're ready to do that um, because, you have to assume that a lot of this early stage stuff can go to zero. So if you don't have enough diversification in your portfolio and you don't have um, the flexibility to potentially lose that capital because early stage investing is risky, that's a bad idea. So as fun as it can be to get on this bandwagon of I want to invest in women, um, it may be that the public um, stock opportunities are a better first starting point and then when you've you know, gotten enough capital that you have that flexibility to potentially lose the risky capital and hopefully get the great upside that comes with it, that you can look at those other tools. But I don't want to 
uh, uh, act as an investment advisor. So, <laughs> well, that is good advice anyway. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, if, you know, if investment advice, but it's definitely great advice for any sort of investing. On the other side, on the startup side, what suggestions do you have for um, female founders to get their to find their voice and to um, get in front of, of the proper VC? Yeah. So um, a couple different things. First of all, I think we're thinking, finding, I mean, it's not scientifically proven yet, but that the traditional pitch process um, for what it may be one of the reasons that women are struggling for whatever cultural biases that what both men and women have against women that have built up over time that we're not going to change overnight, that finding alternatives to having to, you know, stand in front of an audience and do a pitch or sit in a, you know, sort of traditional pitch meeting can be advantageous. And the reason I mention that is there are some, you know, alternative channels, like if you look at equity crowdfunding, something like 40% of the deals on there uh, that get funded are women-led, whereas, you know, we've got these, you know, single-digit yeah. numbers on the VC side. Um, and so it, it begs the question, you know, what's different over here? We look at models where, Peer groups select of their peers which companies they think are the best, and that women-led companies, you know, get chosen an order of magnitude more than in the VC space. Uh, same for minority entrepreneurs who have similar, you know, low levels of funding. So, to the extent that you can get into accelerator programs and other places where you're doing relationship building with potential mm -hmm. investors over time, where you're actually getting to show, tell your story and not sit in a pitch environment, you know, I think that that can be valuable. Um, I think there are another couple factors, and you know, with like all of these things, they can be looked at as stereotypes, and they aren't true for every entrepreneur. But one of the things, um, and this is starting to get circulated enough to maybe it's known, but women, um, while they tend to overdeliver on their, you know, outperformance in these team environments, tend to set, um, you know, sort of achievable expectations, and so that they can then, you know, overcome them, you know. And mm -hmm. that means often that they're selling a smaller story because they want to make sure that they can actually deliver on it. Right. And that's I've, I've heard great. that before a that's lot. That's great in an execution environment that you're actually, you know, delivering on, on your expectations, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not suggesting you ever tell something you don't see or believe, but the um, pitching or selling opportunity is about what it could be, not okay. what you know it will be. Right. And then so a lot of times women are selling me, I am 100 percent confident I can hit this, whereas the pitch opportunity should be a, there's a chance it could be as big as X. So the first is making sure that in the environments that you're in, that you're selling the right story, um, about, you know, the story that you believe and can support with data, but is the biggest opportunity, not the safest, most achievable story. Um, and, and that can make a big difference in the pitching environment. Um, and the same thing then happens when you're actually in that environment. The um, investors who are watching you may be asking questions that pull you down or pu push you up. So there was a recent study that we've been quoting about recently at Columbia University that looked at TechCrunch and who was pitching there and what kinds of questions were asked. The women were asked what were considered to be prevention-oriented questions, yes. i.e., what will you do if this goes wrong or how are you going to mitigate these risks, which tend to shrink the opportunity or instill doubt, and men were tended to be asked promotion-oriented questions, i.e., how big can this be? How amazing is it? Um, and so you can reframe your answer if you get asked a prevention-oriented question and reframe it around the promotion-oriented answer. And so, you know, being, you know, really perceptive and proactive about those things. The same thing is true. There's been some studies around the language that's used to describe women entrepreneurs versus men entrepreneurs. You could have the exact same skill set, and one could be looked at as, you know, sort of ambitious. The other could be looked at as, you know, sort of underachieving, you know. And so um, making sure that you understand the environment that you're in and how you reposition yourself, um, it, you know, some of those things, if you have someone who really is truly biased, whether it's intentional or not, they might not be the best. You might not win that situation, but the more you're aware of it and you're actually kind of proactively working to solve for it is great, and or finding alternate channels, right? So I don't in any world think that women should only go find VC funds that are proactively looking at women or angel groups that are proactively looking at women, uh, but certainly knowing if there's one that actually fits the areas that you're looking at um, that might give you more of a chance, you take that, you know, you take that opportunity. Uh, but you also have to learn to live in the world that everybody else lives in, Correct. and so trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to, you know, be aware of the ways you might be being assessed and figure out what tools you can use to not put yourself into those boxes.
<laughs> Seriously, that is spectacular advice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've never heard of um, of any advice being told to women to over, not over deliver, or over um, promise. Basically, what you you're not saying over promise. You're saying just create the vision. Tell, tell so, the big story. Yeah. I mean, this does, so there's this analogy that goes around, which is about applying for a job. And I'm not going to get the data right because I, I haven't studied the study, but. It says, mm -hmm. You know, if there's a job description out there, women tend to feel like they ha have to have 100% of the criteria yeah. in order to apply, right? They right. need to have all the boxes checked, and right. men look at it, and they go, oh, I can do 40% of these things. I'll apply. And well, again, I'm getting the data. Maybe, maybe those numbers are not exactly yeah. right, but this is a similar concept here, right, is the stretch goals and knowing when is the right time to be stretching and when's the right time to be really pragmatic. And so in the operation of your company and the execution, pragmatism matters. In a pitch environment, you're selling. And so the big opportunity, you know, and the biggest op is the biggest potential is what you need to be selling. And, and understanding the difference between those two and when, when which story is appropriate. Um, amazing. Um, and that's going to help a lot of women. Um, it's just a matter of changing your perspective on just on the pitch because you're going to run your company how you're going to run your company anyway. You're still going to, you know, go for the goals. Um, but understanding that in that pitch environment, it really matters how you, big you're seeing your vision and how big you can, um, you know, you're selling your, your product. Yeah, I mean, as an exercise, like, you know, I've used this, for example, the development teams when you're trying to get them to say, when can they have a product done? Yes. Um, and you could say, okay, well, here's the product features, when do you think you can have it done? And they might say, six weeks. And you said, well, what if you, you know, had to give me that with 95% certainty? And then they might be like, ooh, I'm going to need maybe 10 weeks to be that sure. Whereas if I said, okay, but if you, you know, if I only need you to have 30% certainty, how long might it take you? And then they're like, ah, oh, roughly, and with what I know now, here's how big it could be. And so similarly, maybe with your story of how big is it going to be, you're with 95 to 100% accuracy plan is the achievable plan. But mm -hmm. you're you know, if everything went right and it was all a perfect world and all the things I thought were true and my assumptions spreadsheet were true, this is how big it would be. And then over time, you're um, getting more data around those assumptions to narrow in on, you know, the reality of, of the opportunity. Awesome. All right. Um, what drives you, Carrie? Like, who or what is your inspiration? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I, <laughs> I feel like I've always been just pretty self-motivated. Um, I love learning about new innovations and new science. I mean, the fun part of what we do, um, which Sarah and I get to do now that we're done fundraising, is meet with entrepreneurs about mm -hmm. the next innovations. Um, when whether that's the technical innovations or the scientific discoveries or just new approaches or new business models or new ways to think about pulling things together, um, it's really fun and exciting. And I think figuring out when you can actually bring what you have to bear, whether it's your relationship to your past experience and having done similar things, to actually be able to help you know, pour fuel on the fire for those opportunities or mitigate risks that you've seen already and, and you know, kind of get them going on the right path is really exciting. So, um, you know, hearing about new things and then figuring out where you can help those things actually succeed is, is you know, pretty exciting. That is pretty exciting. Um, all right, so we're starting a series called Women One on One. Based on a previous uh, recording, podcast recording, we realized that there's a lot of introduction to how millennials think and how to integrate millennials into your working environment, corporate or otherwise. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, explanations on how to integrate, you know, baby boomers and, and hip hippies and hipsters and what's their motivation and, you know, how to integrate them better. Well, there's nothing for women. And uh, so what would be something that um, you could think that would be beneficial to explain women um, in a business environment to men, but also some women? That's so interesting. I get, you know, I suppose it's probably because, you know, no matter what walk of life you've come from, you've always been around the other gender. And so people probably presume to think they know them. I actually <laughs> think, though, to presume that I could explain, you know, in aggregate to business people what women all want, I think would be hard. I do think that women tend... One, one thing. Yeah, I was going to say, tend to value um, flexibility um, and, and autonomy and being able to actually, you know, find ways to juggle their work life into their home life because regardless of whether it's fair or whether it'll change or whatever, the burden of, um, you know, sort of parenting and child care yeah. and home care still tends to, and certainly there are changing models of this, fall on the woman as well while she's also doing that. And they get all these questions about how are you going to balance, you know, being an effective executive with being a parent. Yeah. It's like that doesn't get asked of the man. 
Um, so giving <laughs> giving tools to the women to be able to navigate those things without putting too much rigor around that. The woman, mm -hmm. women will figure out how to balance their life just the way the men are figuring out how to balance being uh, parents, et cetera. But giving them the flexibility and the autonomy, autonomy to do that, I think, is important. Um, but I also think... Um, well, it's a bigger it's a bigger conversation, but actually figuring out how to have the uh, you know conversations in the workplace around what the women need is important because I think it's going to matter differently in different workplaces. And so um, you know, sort of making this blanket statement doesn't address the the women in the environment that each company is going to be in. Correct, but um, the the point of what we're trying to do is basically just start the conversation. Um, yeah. You know, just kind of gather some data um, from women that are in business. <clears throat> and women that are doing this. So um, it's what's important to you matters, and that's kind of what we're trying to, to, to do with Women 101. Um, all right, Carrie, so I'm done with the super heavy questions. <laughs> um, a little bit more personal, is that okay? Can I have uh, sure. some more questions? All right, so um, what is your favorite book? And if that's your favorite book, uh, do you have a business book that you would like to uh, get? Oh, a favorite book. Okay, so this is so nerdy, but I think it's really, really an important one for – Startup Founders, it's probably right here on the shelf next to me. Um, okay, so I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, I think that any startup that's going to seek venture funding needs to get Brad Feld's book, Venture Deals, and it, the subtitle is How to Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer or Venture Capitalist. Nice. Um, because it really lays out in a readable, to the extent that legalese is readable, but uh, we, uh, a reasonable way what's going to happen when you go through the fundraising process. Mm -hmm. um, and what terms you should fight for, what terms you shouldn't, and it's really thought about from the entrepreneur's point of view, but it also explains the, you know, VC and lawyer's points of view. Yes. Um, and I guess as a predecessor step to that is make sure your company needs outside funding, and if it needs outside funding, whether it's appropriate to get angel funding or crowdsource funding or whether you're in a place to get debt or whether venture capital is for you because uh, it should never be a given that you need any of that or that that all is right for you. So. That particular book is definitely more about once you're going to go down the venture capital path, but I think it's a really important fundamental reading for everyone so that they're on a level playing field. Venture mm -hmm. capitalists basically invest in, you know, tens of, if not, you know, dozens of companies per year, and they mm -hmm. you know, are doing it every year, and they get very good at negotiating the term sheet. And even if an entrepreneur is really great, over the course of one company, they're going to raise funding four times maybe with a seed series, you know, friends and family seed, series A, series B. You know, I mean, you're not going to raise that. And so you're just at a disadvantage. And yeah. so making sure that you're up to speed on um, those things I think is really critical. Um, that's probably not my favorite thing to read just sort of like on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Um, but I read a lot of books. I'm not sure I could come up with a favorite. So that's my favorite to recommend for sure. This is really good. Uh, so it's going to help a lot of women entrepreneurs and, and male entrepreneurs as well. Why not? Um, it's the same thing. It's, it's good advice for everybody. So, um, all right. Um, what's a struggle that you've had that kind of puts you on the path that you're on? Oh, a struggle. I mean, when I was running my own company, the, the travel company, it wasn't yeah. just the dynamics of the, you know, sort of ex external financial ecosystem that was hard. I was a single founder. Um, and so I had some other people on my team, but I was, I'm an E, so I generally think out loud and I need to whiteboard stuff and yep. kind of talk through things to, um, to, you know, to get there. And I didn't have that resource, you know, at least internally on my team, which I think is a, a challenge. I think being a single founder is pretty hard and I wouldn't recommend it to someone, but you know, if, if you are in that circumstance, where do you find your sounding board? Your team. Um, and so I, yeah, I think, you know, knowing that there are groups around you that you can, you know, find peers, I think is really yeah. important. At the time I actually read a book by Jack, just, or edited by Jessica Livingston, who was um, of Y Combinator um, history. She had put together, I think it was called founders at work. And it was stories of all of these great successful um, startups that you know today, but in their early days of the highs and the lows. Um, and reading that and realizing, oh, it's not just me. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this chart, but it's like what people think success looks like, and it's like yes. you know, this line up and to the right. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, what it really looks like, and it's not just like ups and downs. It's like <laughs> wiggly lines, and it goes around. And so that's probably what it's going to be like, and you're going to be more emotionally attached to each high and low and squiggle in the different direction because it's your thing. It's not just my job and, oh, shoot, something went wrong today at work. It's like this is everything I'm putting all my resources into, and so the highs and lows can be all the more challenging. So recognizing that you're not crazy if that's the case and seeing that it happened to other people and how they navigated it through, but having a support group, whether it is co-founders or um, peers who are going to get it because a lot of times like your partner in life or whatever doesn't 
live in the same world, a startup world is a different ecosystem, and understanding that with someone who gets it is really important. And so there are some great groups now um, just of entrepreneurs in general and then of women founders. Um, you know, you find the place that's a fit for you. I don't think everything needs to be just women working with women, but um, yes. you know, certainly there are some there. People who get you and people who you can ask vulnerable questions of, like, oh, God, this terrible thing happened. What do I do now? Or is this a terrible thing? Or is this just normal? Um, and being able to have a sounding board is really important. And so, um, you know, I think those are some of the lessons I learned from my failed startup, um, you know, what I would have done or what I would do differently the second time around, but also the tools I want, you know, entrepreneurs to have available to them. That's beautiful. And actually, The Founders of Work is a really good book for anybody. Um, I mean, the, the story about the, how PayPal came about. And yeah, like I was going to reference that one. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a good, I'm like, Seriously, all of these changes and, and, and what, what was important, uh, coding, um, everything just one step at a time and how it, you know, like, like we were talking earlier, it wasn't a straight line. It was like it went this way and then it went that way and it went back this way. And it, it, just, it was like that until it's kind of is what it is right now. Um, so massive, massively important to read for, for anybody in the startup world. All right, one last question, Carrie. Yeah. Um, if you're putting up a billboard, what would you put on the billboard? What message you would put up a billboard, on the billboard? And where would you put this billboard? Oh, geez, there's all these really powerful things going on in the world right now where people are doing this with billboards. But I guess our billboard is definitely around um, helping people know the data around women. Um, for women, being able to leverage as an asset. So, so much of the conversation to date, or at least, you know, that Sarah and I saw as we were starting the fund, was around the negativeness of the numbers of how few women are funded, how few women are in venture capital. Um, and that's just real and it's depressing. But doesn't yeah. get you doesn't move you forward. Um, and so we really spend time trying to help women understand where they actually have assets by being women, but that this gender diversity does lead to higher performance, um, what some of their skill sets are that let them do that, and how they ought to consider that an advantage and leverage it to their advantage. Um, and so helping uh, expose people to the data that gender diverse teams will actually outperform and that they ought to consider, you know, sort of incorporating that into their own teams, whether that's startup teams or otherwise, um, to their advantage, we think is awesome. And so we think that, um, you know, eventually our startups will show that that's true and be, again, part of the continuing data set to change people's mindset and behavior, because behavior change is super hard. And so we can share, show the data, but we've got to actually change behavior, and, and that will be um, all the more convincing when you're making more money. And change culture, um, yeah. too, because... Yeah. Um, you can change one person here and one person there, but to change the entire zeitgeist, it's it's going to well, take. Well, money a long might time. talk, so we'll see. <laughs> money does talk. <laughs> All right, Carrie, thank you so very much for your time today. I really yeah, greatly appreciate it. Interview. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, at the Business Magazine Women's Podcast, and we'll have all of Carrie's information with the podcast, and um, we're going to be able to to see what she says on um, in our in our coming up um, issue on finance. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll. See you all next time. Thank you so much, everybody. Top of the world. Top of Hi, everybody, and thanks again for tuning in today. Just to remind you, for the price of a cup of coffee or tea, you can now hear your name or your company's name on our podcast. Make your way to patreon.com forward slash Wonder Women podcast and show your support for us so that we can create more opportunities for female founders and women entrepreneurs to be seen and heard and get funded. Everybody follows you oh, You put your money where your mouth is oh. The music for our podcast is graciously provided by our very own Wonder Woman, Cheryl B. Engelhart. We'll have the podcast we've recorded with her out in the next few weeks. Stay tuned and don't forget to go get your free music bundle at cbemusic.com. That is cbemusic.com. Thanks, everybody, and remember to subscribe. See you all next time. Bye.